Good morning. Well, we had a wonderful, wonderful day yesterday at uh, Reverend Tony Viglione's ordination, and uh, we were well represented, Suncoast, and really felt our part in his process. And um, today, our offertory uh, will not include Reverend Rene in our trio because <coughs> today, Reverend Rene is being honored by MCC globally at Church of the Trinity, where she served as interim pastor, and she is getting this year's interim pastor award from MCC. So. <laughs> Reverend Vicki is away with her uh, wife Carol and friends in Peru on vacation, and they're having, I've seen pictures, they're having a wonderful time, and pray for their safe return this week. Last but not least, I want to say that several of you have responded to uh, the ad in the bulletin about the church sign and contributing to help us finish off that campaign, and I'm very grateful for those who have responded. And uh, once we, we finish our campaign, we have about five, six thousand dollars left to raise, and when we do that, uh, we will have a wonderful celebration and honor everyone who's given. And some people are making pledges over several months, and that's just fine. That's great. We really appreciate that. Uh, we are already seeing wonderful benefits from our sign. And uh, I know uh, every time I come on the property, I'm still a little surprised to see it there <laughs> and enjoy it. And I know uh, that it will, will bless us as we reach out with the message of God's love. Will you pray with me? Thank you, God for this place to worship. Thank you for all who made it possible. Thank you for uh, creating us to be your people and for giving us a vision and a mission. In Jesus' name, amen. In this season of Pentecost, we're challenging ourselves to be true to our MCC values and to consider those who are still outsiders in our communities. Jesus called disciples to follow him, to minister and reach out to those who were outsiders in his day. In order to do that, he called them to leave their homes and security, to go on the road with him, to sleep outdoors, perhaps in the barns or in the homes of strangers or other followers. He says with some wistfulness that he has nowhere to lay his head. Following Jesus comes with a warning. If you follow me, you may not be staying at the luxury hotel in town. <laughs> there may be no place you can go and bolt the door <clears throat> and be just with yourself and your family. That was the cost of following Jesus then. Francis of Assisi did that as well. He chose to leave his wealthy family and home and became a foolish beggar who lived on the streets so that he could more authentically follow Jesus. For 900 years or so, many Franciscans, men and women, have given up security to live and serve the poor, some at great risk to themselves. In the United States today, only about 6% of people who are homeless choose to be homeless. About three million people are homeless in the U.S. at any given day, and the majority are children in families. Seventy percent of homeless people are homeless for less than two years. Thirty percent are more chronically homeless. Twenty-five to thirty-five percent are homeless because of addiction, and fifteen to twenty-five percent are mentally ill. Homeless people do not commit crimes at any higher rate than the generic population. Homelessness is not only physically dangerous, it also means taking away privacy, dignity, and psychological safety. Being able to come home, to shut my door, to sit in a comfortable chair, to sleep in my own bed, these are privileges that three million people today in this country and hundreds of millions of homeless refugees around the world do not have. <coughs> my mother's family was from Long Island, New York, and my grandfather 
was a Wall Street accountant when the crash of 1929 happened. He lost his job that supported seven children and a mortgage, and then he had a stroke and was never able to work again. These are the days before there were safety nets of any kind. And only because my grandmother had two <coughs> relatively well-off Quaker cousins who paid their mortgage, probably for 15 or 20 years, until it was paid off. It was the only reason I think their family didn't have to split apart or become homeless. Many of us in this room could tell stories like that about our families or our family history. The cause of homelessness are as, variety, are as varied as the people it impacts. And often our stereotypes don't bear out. The lack of affordable housing is the number one cause today. Housing requires a greater and greater percentage of income. And that is getting worse and worse. It used to be that a quarter to maybe a third of your income should be what goes to housing today. For many people, it's more than 50%, and it is unmanageable. Income inequality means those making minimum wage or lower wages cannot afford decent housing in this country. Healthcare costs now throw people into homelessness. Ill health causes people to lose jobs and income. The safety net does not work for many. And some are homeless because they're escaping violence domestic violence, teens who are victims of bullying, abuse. Minority groups experience all of this at higher rates. I think particularly of transgender women of color who are at such a high rate of homelessness. And this makes them so much more vulnerable to violence. Most Western countries, except us, <laughs> seem to be able to prevent or cure homelessness much more successfully. One of the most poignant documentaries I ever saw was one about a public school in Arizona that was geared towards homeless children who are often bullied in public schools. That amazing school provided not only breakfast and lunch, but showers for children who had nowhere to clean up, clean backpacks, a clothing closet where they could get clean clothes, and shoes that fit, a place to do homework before they left school. If a child was not in school, staff actually went to search for them in places that homeless people go, even helping them to get transportation to school if they needed it. They reached out with resources not just for the kid, but for the whole family. And every kid in this school was in the same boat, and the staff and teachers were geared up to provide the maximum support so their education would not be interrupted. I remember most poignantly the kids tearfully expressing gratitude for not having to hide or cover up their homelessness or to be shamed. They were not alone in needing a meal or a shower or a hug or a place to do homework. The sense of relief they expressed was palpable. It was a huge success. But the school district was told by the courts that they could not continue this special school because it segregated these kids. They had to be mainstreamed, even though the kids were benefiting so much for the special attention that helped them. It seemed like such a horrible injustice. If mainstream schools were unable to prevent kids from being bullied, or to really meet their needs to continue in school. Why not segregate them for a time as needed? Some people have no house. They may live in a tent or a car or shelter. But if they have a family member or a pet, they may still feel they have a home. Sometimes our family is our home. <laughs> it's heartbreaking to see how people who lose housing struggle to keep their families, their pets, together. We can also expand our definition of homelessness. Some people have houses, but they are dying of loneliness in them. Some people have a house, but no home. Some people return every day to a home in which there is domestic violence or abuse, where there's no safety. 
where home is a tenuous thing, ready to explode or evaporate. Some people, many of whom come to this church, have been spiritually homeless. As we came out or transitioned or changed our hearts and minds about what we thought about God and church, we found that our spiritual homes did not fit us anymore. Or maybe we were tossed out or made to feel unwelcome. That is why messages of welcome are so vital here. Week after week, some people who come here have never really had a spiritual home that embraced them fully, just as we are. I think that's why when we say we need a roof for the church, people in this church are generous to a fault because this is our home too. <laughs> this is our spiritual house, whatever our personal circumstances. I learned a lesson years ago in Los Angeles when our church building was destroyed in an earthquake. And as a pastor, I was a lot younger than I was trying to comfort and, and cheer up people in the church and, you know, kind of said, you know, well, the church isn't a building, it's our community, and, and in one sense, kind of giving the message, well, it's not such a big deal. And I tell you, I got corrected by people in the church who said, pastor, it is a big deal. Uh, we were homeless as a church for, for many, many years, about almost three full years. And they said, Pastor, this building uh, is not nothing. It's important to us. We sacrificed for it. It is a place where my wedding or my partner's funeral or something special, I experienced healing and acceptance and hope. Let's not trivialize <laughs> what this is. It's not just a building. <laughs> and they were right. Suncoast, we have an emotional and spiritual attachment to this space. To this place, it's deep because of all it has seen, because of the friendships, who we met here, what it has meant for so many. We heard that, didn't we, yesterday in Tony's ordination. And as we heard the choir sing this morning, home is also a metaphor for our eternal home, for heaven. To be a person of faith is to trust that God has indeed prepared for us a place, whatever our condition here. We will be welcome and safe in the arms of God for eternity. You know, the closer I get to eternity, the less and less I think I really know about it. But one thing I do know, and that is that I will not be disappointed, and that there is no homelessness in heaven, <laughs> no anxiety about where we will lay our heads, or if there is space for us. Even as we connect the dots between literal houselessness and homelessness and the pain of being spiritually homeless, I think we do have to stay focused on those three million human beings, most of them children, who today do not have a house to go to, their own room or a bed to sleep in. Jesus, we are told, identified with them and asks us to as well. So what shall we do? Lauren Bennett, in her amazing poem, See Them, says the first thing we can do is to see them. <laughs> Be curious about what causes homelessness. See them as human beings, people for whom Christ died. Make them visible by looking them in the eyes. I believe this is what attracted people to Jesus. He saw them. He was curious about them. Love flowed through him to them. He engaged them. He asked his followers to be willing to touch them and heal them, to stop for them. I think of Reverend Vicki's sermon weeks ago about her friend Jerry, the homeless man who lives in a tent behind a garage near where she lives. Her sense of discomfort, her failed attempts to help him, <coughs> her honesty about what it took to have a more honest relationship with him was about seeing him. The sight of visible homeless people holding signs on street corners sometimes makes us uncomfortable. It's hard to see them or look them in the eye, not to have judgments many times. Most homeless people, though, are never visible like that. Most we never see. We cannot solve homelessness by ourselves, but we can do something. Suncoast, next month, we're going to put a toe in the water with a local organization called Family Promise. 
Several times a year, Unity Next Door and the UUA Church, Unitarian Church, provide housing, food, and support for homeless families for two-week periods. That helps them get stabilized while they look to help them find permanent housing. We can help them as, uh, we offer, as they offer hospitality. A small group of us will do that in mid-July after General Conference. We will be helping at the Unitarian Church to feed and host a dinner for three small families. In addition, we support the mental health of people in our church and try to support those in recovery from addiction. Offering space for three 12-step groups in our church is one way we also can prevent homelessness. Some MCCs like Church of the Trinity in Sarasota support a local school who have children who live in poverty. They help with uniforms, backpacks, and supplies, sometimes with Thanksgiving dinners for family. They took years to develop that relationship and different twists and turns and, and learned how to do it better. They prevent families from experiencing homelessness. MCC New York, for 20 years, the first floor of the building they own in Manhattan is a shelter for homeless queer youth. Hundreds of youth have been rescued by them help to transition to adult life, to permanent housing, school, and jobs. They've also done extensive work providing support, community for homeless transgender people. I'm proud to be part of a denomination that includes churches like MCC New York. How many of us in this room wonder or worry about how we'll take care of ourselves or be taken care of later in life? What kind of home will we have three, five, or 10 years from now? One option for the future of our church is to strategically work with other organizations to be a part of addressing challenges for senior housing in our community. And hopefully, we are all people who vote, creating a society that takes seriously the root causes of homelessness, that cares about providing emergency and affordable housing, that strives to reduce the cost of housing and promote policies that reduce income inequality. This is part of our job as citizens and people of faith. We have to make our politicians accountable and hopefully to care about those who are struggling to, to become people who have a decent housing and home in their lives. This upcoming census has been controversial for many reasons. Next year's the census, counting LGBT household, asking questions about citizenship that care people away, but also the census severely undercounts those who are without permanent housing, people whose permanent address is nowhere, who live in sheds or garages or in tin shacks off of alleyways. By undercounting them, we make them invisible and say they don't count as a part of our country. Speaking up for people who are not counted, who don't count, helping to count them, <laughs> is what it means to follow Jesus who gave up his home to redeem the world. It is a fact that when people have a spiritual home, it helps prevent literal homelessness. By opening our doors, our hearts to everyone, we make a difference. People who have a community that cares about them are less likely to fall off the map. Isolation greatly increases the danger of becoming homeless. Jesus said that as we do it to the least of these, we do it to him. Remembering those who are homeless in our prayers is part of our calling, but really seeing them and finding ways to be part of the solution is what it really means to love the outsider. Now I want to invite you to do something. Reach into your pocket or purse or whatever and take out your keys. Maybe you, some of you have keys to the church. I'm holding up my church keys right now. Find your keys for a minute. <clears throat> if you don't mind, as you can, rise as you're able. Hold the keys in your hand, jingle them just a little bit if you can. <laughs> just for this minute, let us give thanks that we are privileged people who have a place to live. A place where we can close the door. We have a place we can come to church. 
Maybe there was a time you did not have a secure place to live or your own keys to a home. Let's remember today those who have no keys. As we watch this very short video, let's continue to stand with them and hold on to our keys. I've never seen a diamond in the flat. I cut my teeth on wedding rings in the movies. And I'm not proud of my address. In the torn up town, no postcode envy. But every song's like old teeth, gray goose tripping in the bathroom, blood stains, ball gowns, trash in the hotel room. We don't care. We're driving Cadillacs in our dreams. But everybody's like crystal, made back diamonds on your timepiece, jet planes, islands, tigers on a gold leash. We don't care. We aren't caught up in your love affair, and we'll never be royal. Kinda likes to sing for us We crave a different kind of vibe Let me be your ruler, ruler. You can call me King B 